I mentioned to uh, Brother Brantley just a few minutes ago, I asked him a very important question. Who's preaching? I'm going to take a nap back there. <laughs> that was a wonderful meal, and uh, I probably ate a little too much. But nothing like uh, someone who was sitting right next to me ate. 517. That's the song of invitation. That person was Carl. I had forgotten how much Carl liked to eat. I thought that pr uh, plate was going to break in half. But uh, what really got me was the dessert. And that's when I thought about starting to switch my sermon to gluttony instead of the one tonight. But then he said if I did that, I would have to preach also on coveting another person's plate. So I'll shy away from that. Once again, I'm very thankful for the elders, this congregation, for a number of reasons. I'm very thankful for the stand that they continue to make for the truth here at Bellevue. Uh, I'm thankful for the invitation to be here, to be back home, to see all of you folks again, and get to meet some new folks as well, and new members, which is always a blessing. Thankful for the dinner tonight, the dessert, I very much appreciate those who worked hard to prepare all this stuff. Uh, I know Brother Brantley said he went fishing for the catfish at Publix, uh, their pond, uh, so, sometime this afternoon. So that's hard work. And uh, also thankful for the songs that he's been picking out, uh, especially that last one that goes right along with the sermon tonight. We've been talking about living a, a godly life in an ever-increasing ungodly world. And uh, it is becoming even more ungodly, but it is possible to still remain faithful to God through uh, all the things that are taking place at any time of our life. And when we think about that, and we noticed last, uh, yesterday afternoon, I keep wanting to say last night, because that's what we meet at six in Denver, but, uh, Yesterday afternoon, we noticed some of the rewards of godliness and true rich rewards that they are, not just the reward of eternal life after this life is over, but also having a godly, wonderful, blessed life now, in the here and now. But to think that God would not give us any kind of protection, any help, with overcoming the ungodliness of the world, the sins of the world, would be ludicrous to think that. Of course he knew what we were going to face in this life, including right now. So he did give us some weapons. He did give us some armor. And let's face it, we know how the story ends. You read the book of Revelation, you know how it ends. Good will overcome evil. Our God in heaven is stronger than the devil is. So all we have to do is follow his word, remain faithful to him, and heaven will be ours. So we know the end of the story as the saying goes. But in helping us to overcome evil, we're going to look tonight at the Christian's armor. Now this is found in Ephesians chapter 6, and I know you've heard sermons on this topic before. Uh, probably have had it taught in Bible class on the book of Ephesians as well. So once again, what I am going to be teaching tonight is not anything new. It's very simple to understand. But it's also important to put into our lives, to put into place. The warfare that we are fighting, and it is warfare, is not carnal. It's not physical. It's spiritual, which is even more, you could say, deadly. Soldiers in combat, sometimes they get wounded. Sometimes they lose their lives in combat. But if we lose our lives in this spiritual warfare, we lose everything. Because that is spiritual death. Much more important than physical death. Now, Paul wrote this epistle, as we all know, from Rome while he was in prison. 
Now at that period of time, if you were in prison waiting for trial to go to see Caesar, you were shackled to a Roman 24 hours a day. <laughs> you could see he also had a rather captive audience. So he knew what a Roman soldier looked like, how they acted, but he also knew the kind of armor that they wore, the protection that they had. He would also later write that no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. 2 Timothy 2.4. You know, when, if you were a legionnaire at that period of time, that was your job. That was your only job. You didn't have another side work that you could be doing. Because when they called you to battle, you need to be ready to go right then and there. As us, as Christians, this is it for us. This is our work. We need to be that soldier for our Lord and Savior, and we need to be constantly ready for the fight. But let's begin reading this evening in verse 10, Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll read down to verse 17. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, as it states in verse 10. Be strong in the Lord. The only hope that we all have is that, to be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. As Christians, we are to fight the good fight of faith, 1 Timothy 6, 12. We are to war a good warfare, 1 Timothy 1, 18. That means being always vigilant, always ready, always prepared, never running from battle when it comes. God has never asked us to do something that we cannot do. But what we can do, he's not going to do it for us either. So these are things that we have to do and can do. How can we be strong in the Lord? That's in the power of his might. Not ours, but in his might. That's where we get our strength. That's where we get our hope of overcoming wickedness, evil, sin. That's how we can be strong as Christians in him. Jeremiah understood this so many years ago, thousands of years ago, when he wrote, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps, Jeremiah 10, 23. Not our steps. There's a song that we sometimes sing about following in the steps of Jesus. Walking in his steps. That's the point that's being made here as well. We need to walk in his steps. Instead of following after our own. And yet so many people today decide that they want to walk in their own ways. Making up their own righteousness. Because they don't want to walk in the fifth steps of Jesus. They don't want to follow his commandments. Uh, it's always interesting when you talk to someone who says that they, they believe in God. But they don't really believe God. And there's a huge difference. It's easy to see, uh, say, I believe in God or I love God. 
But if I don't really believe in what he is telling me to how to live my lives, then I really don't believe him. If ye love me, keep my commandments. I've always looked at that passage thinking, he's telling me I've got to prove this. I've got to prove that I love him. How do I do that? By keeping his commandments. Don't make up my own. Follow in his footsteps. 1 Peter 2 verse 21 goes right along with what Jeremiah had to say as well. We need to follow after God, his way, and not our own might. But knowing that, and if we're doing that, we can say, along with the Apostle Paul, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Philippians 4.13. This is not the first time I've mentioned that verse in this gospel meeting. I don't think it's going to be the last either. We can do all things, but it's through Christ. And you look at the Apostle Paul and you think about all the work that he did, all the teachings that he did. He never took credit for himself. In passages where the Holy Spirit told him to write certain things out, you could almost feel that he was embarrassed by saying some of these things. He didn't want to give himself credit. He always gave credit to the Lord. And so, so should we. We should do the same thing. It's a shame when people choose not to rely upon God. Now those in the world cannot rely upon him. You know what's even worse? is when members of the Lord's body do not rely upon him as they should. We get caught up in the things of this world so easily. We can begin to think about, well, what if happens if I lose my job? Or where I'll, I'll ever be able to retire? Or this, that, and the other. And by the way, you know what the best retirement is? Being faithful to God. You're going to go to heaven. That's the best retirement. It's not something man could devise, but God did. But if we don't rely upon him, that says something about our faith. It needs to get stronger. It needs to be stronger. Now the atheists will say that those who believe in God and follow the scriptures, well, he's, that's just a crutch that they have to lean on. God's not my crutch. He's my strength. He's our rock. That's who he is, not a crutch. So we are to put on the whole armor of God, as verse 11 says, and I'm very thankful for that last song. I had a funny feeling you would be leading that song, and uh, the perfect time for it. The whole armor of God. The Greek word is panoplium, and I love one of the definitions that I found about this word. This word is describing the full armor of a heavy armed soldier. And of course, that's where we get the uh, English word panoply. Every individual Christian put on the whole armor of God. Everyone must do this. God's not going to do it for us. We have to do these things. And you think about that legionnaire getting ready, preparing for a battle. I guarantee you they had their whole armor on for protection and safety. Well, you want to talk about one of the greatest armies the world's ever seen, that's Rome. They were able to win so many battles because preparation. And we can overcome so many battles in our life for the Lord if we are prepared, if we're putting on that whole armor. We can't rely on others to do it for us. I can't do these things for you, and you, you can't do it for me either. And you know, when you look at this, this armor that is described here, you notice that there's nothing for the backside. You can't turn around and cut and run. You'll be cut down. But we need to put it all on. God gave us this armor. He's not going to put it on for us. We must do that. 
and not partially clothed. But why do this? As the verse says, so we can stand against the wiles of the devil, the craftiness of Satan, the trickery that he uses. A lot of people in the world think of, when they think of the devil or they think of Satan, if they think of him at all, they think of this cartoon character, that red suit, pointy tail, and the pitchfork. But he is an adversary. And the word adversary in 1 Peter 5, 8, that means enemy. He is an enemy. Walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. In other words, he's always walking about, seeing who he can destroy. We, we talked about the scriptures. It tells us the end of the story. God wins. Those who are faithful, they'll win. Satan knows he has lost this battle. He knows that he's going to spend eternity in the fires of hell. And he's so evil, he's so hateful, that he's going to try and bring as many with him as he can. He's already got those in the world. He's after us. He is after the Lord's servants. He hates God. And he hates us. He doesn't take a day off. He doesn't take weekends off. He doesn't take a vacation. He's always trying to destroy souls. He's always on the prowl. Roman soldier put on his own armor. He didn't go into battle without it. Why would we? Why would we not be prepared? Verse 12 is an interesting passage. You could spend a, a number of sermons just on this passage. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Again, this is not a carnal physical battle that we're waging, that we are in. It's a spiritual battle. 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. Paul wrote, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Our spiritual weapons are due to God. And they are a strong defense against Satan, against his craftiness, the wiles of the devil, against the ungodliness in this world. The old saying, we live in the world, but we are not of the world, is a true saying. But we should be prepared, and we need to be reminded to be repaired as well. All of us do. Satan is referred to in a number of ways. One is he is the prince of the air, Ephesians 2, verse 2. He is the prince of the world, John 12, verse 31 as well. But under his command are these evil spirits, these demonic forces that are arrayed against us. I think this verse gives us a little insight into the magnitude of the fight that we are involved in the warfare that we are up against. I remember one of the instructors at MSOP a number of years ago, not as long ago as some people surmise, but uh, it has been a while. But he was mentioning verses like this when he said, you know, it's probably good this spiritual battle, we can't see all these forces that are right against us because they're so numerous. But that's why we have God. And if we're on his side, he's on our side. And we can remain strong through the power of his might. We can overcome these forces. We can overcome these, the wickedness in high places. But why does Paul mention against the importance of taking up the whole armor of God? Verse 13. 
And he'll mention a number of these things over and over again in this text. The reason that ye may be able, that word able is mentioned three times in these few verses, to withstand in the evil day. A number of times he refers to the word withstand, other times it is to stand. Another definition would be to resist. You can resist Satan. You can resist these demonic forces arrayed against us. To stand against is another definition of that word. This is not a specific day. This is any day that Satan is coming after us. And it doesn't have to be, of course, Satan himself that comes after us. You drive up and down the street in this town or any town, and you see the forces of Satan arrayed against us. The liquor stores, for example, the other places that evil abides. Turn your TV on, you'll see it there. I mentioned uh, just the other day that what was X-rated just a few years ago, that's, that's on television now. This is how bad it's getting. But you know that. If we're properly equipped, we can withstand Satan and his endless attacks at any time. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, passage that is very familiar to us. It states, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Always be watchful. You know what they did to a Roman soldier on guard duty if they found him asleep? He was executed. Never did it again. So if you're thinking about taking a nap tonight, no, I'm just, I just happened to be looking at Henry. I really wasn't looking at him. But that's what they did. Why it was so important for them to be awake there may be a, a force coming against them. Someone would need to give the shout out. They were needed to always be able to be ready, to be prepared. We always need to be vigilant. Always be watchful. Because we have that adversary that's always going to be on the prowl, seeking whom he may devour. We need to remember, and we always need to remember this, our supreme commander is much more powerful than the old devil is. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 1 John 4, verse 4. Our spiritual armor is, will begin to be mentioned in 13 and verses 14 and following. We are told to stand. Once again, this word is used. Verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand or resist in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Having your loins girt about with truth. The Roman soldier at this period of time had a leather girdle or leather belt that he wore around his waist. It, on it would, of course, be that scabbard with that 22-inch sword, very deadly weapon at that time, one of the greatest swords in history. But there would also be different tools, and it reminds you of soldiers today. They also wear a belt with tools and the weapons on it. Police officers do the, the same thing. Uh, They'll have their sidearm, they will have the flashlight, keys, they will have a taser, all these kind of things as well. So very similar. This period of time, it would be difficult uh, for a sword to slash through it, for even a small javelin to be able to cut through it, because that waist was, of course, very important. But why would Paul use the armor of truth first? very simple. If you don't have the truth, 
Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. Sanctify. To set apart from the world. Set apart from the world to be of service to God. That's what the truth does. Jesus stated, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, 6. That little definite article. The way, the truth, the life means he's the only way, he's the only truth, and he's the only life. That's the only way anyone can come to the Father, is through him. Now, we've heard a lot of stories over the last 20 years or more that people like to state that truth is just outdated. And we were talking a little bit uh, about this at dinner not in that exact context, but you remember Pilate asked Jesus, what is true? So something tells me that there are people even back in his day that really didn't put a lot of emphasis on, on truth. And we have heard about uh, these colleges and these professors at these colleges that are teaching their students that you can't really know the truth. And I remember hearing this story it's either true or it's a preacher story, one or the other. Either way, it's the truth, though. I mean, the preacher said it. But someone in the classroom raised their hand and asked, Professor, are you sure about that? How could he answer that? If you don't know the truth, what could he say? But we can know the truth. Jesus himself said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 32. Set you free from the wickedness of sin, the slavery of sin. So I guess it depends upon who we really want to believe. Whether someone in academia or the Lord. Because he said we can know the truth. And you can know the truth. The reason why people don't want to really know the truth is because they don't really want to know the truth. So why else would you say that? You don't want to know that there is a right, that there is wrong. That's something that really is objective. They like things that are subject. Well, that's just your opinion. Well, not in God's word, it isn't. That opinion is removed. But also he talks about in verse 14 that we need, and we all need to do this, put on that breastplate of righteousness. And you think about the breastplate that that Roman legionnaire wore at that period of time. It would protect the heart. It would protect that vital arg uh, organs, again from a sword or from, a, once again, maybe a, a small javelin. And soldiers today... They wear these things. Call them flak jackets that protect the vest, protect the heart, lungs. Uh, cops, they also wear these things as well. Uh, one of the uh, government offices in another county, uh, they wear them. Even just security wears those. So it's very important. For the Christian, it's even more important. We're talking about righteousness. Having on the breastplate of righteousness. Right doing is another word for that, for righteousness. Very important. It protects our spiritual heart. Many times we look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, and we, we think about the necessities of life will be given to those who are faithful, and that's true. But it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We need to zero in on that. We need to put God, his righteousness, the kingdom first, above everything. We do that, yes, we'll have the necessities of life. We'll have something more important than that. We'll have eternal life. This is a verse Matthew 6, 33, that teaches us how to go to heaven. Put God first in your life. Everything else comes second or third. 
and heaven will be ours. But we have to do that. We must follow after righteousness, 1 Timothy 6, 11. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled, one of the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are that, is that individual who thirsts, who hungers after righteousness. It wasn't just happen chance that Jesus used those two words. These two very strong instincts, powerful instincts of hunger, of thirsting. If you don't have food, you're going to die. If you don't have water to drink, you're going to die. So this is a powerful instinct for a human being. Do we have that same instinct about God's word? Do we hunger? Do we thirst for his word that will make us righteous? Good question. This is something we should ask ourselves. Do we hunger and thirst after the word of God every day? Do we like to read God's holy word? Do we like to study God's holy word? I don't care how many times you read a, a verse in the scriptures or a passage in the scripture. It could be a hundred times. I always come away with learning something new. Always something new. That's the beauty of God's holy word. Read a passage and then close the Bible and meditate upon it as well. How does it affect me with my life? How can I apply it, apply it to my life to help me be a better Christian? Meditation is good as well with God's holy word. This is also not our righteousness. It's not ours. It's following God's holy word who is righteous. In verse 15, we read about the shoes of the soldier of Christ. And you think about the shoes or the sandals that the Roman legionnaire wore. They had to be good. I hear, I work with a fellow who was in the airborne, in the army. And he talks about the marching that he did, the running that they did. And it's like, wow, it's a lot. I don't know if they were in as good a shape as the legionnaires were. You know that saying that uh, all roads lead to Rome? And they did, and for a reason. Now the Christians, of course, used them to carry the gospel of peace everywhere. They also used it for commerce. But a big reason that they were built was if there was any kind of a hot spot any skirmish in the Roman Empire, they started marching. They were going to quench that fire. They were going to put that revolt down. Some of those roads, like the Appian Way, leaving Rome, they're still there. Still there after all these thousands of years. Amazing. But their sandals had these little nails or spikes at the bottom of them. It was for traction. And in battles at this period of time, of course, it was hand to hand, close contact. You didn't want to be slipping all over the place when you were in a fight. Even more important is the shoes of the soldier of Christ because these shoes are the gospel of peace. And we are to carry that gospel of peace throughout the world. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 15, and 16. Again, that's our marching orders as Christians from our commander-in-chief, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we talked the other day about the world and taking the gospel throughout the world. And we mentioned about how sometimes the world can be a neighbor who lives right next to us. But we wear those shoes 
to carry the gospel of peace to those who don't have any peace in their life. And they may not even realize it. That peace of God which passeth all understanding. It brings hope to people. To know that they have that hope of salvation. Romans 10 verse 15. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. And bring glad tidings of good things. What could be more important than to take the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of peace to those who don't have it. What could be more important than that? Nothing. Nothing is more important than that. But we, of course, have to be living that gospel of peace before we attempt it. And to know that he is with us when we do these things. How many times have we had a Bible class set up with an individual and we asked God to be with us that we teach those right things, that he'll give us the courage to say these things. We're always praying that as we're going to go meet someone. Every time I stand up to preach the gospel, I pray that same thing as well, that God will be with me, that he will give me the strength to say the things that I need to say and not to shy away from it. And we know that the God of peace shall be with you shall be with us Philippians 4 9 and preaching the gospel of peace it must never be at the cost of that gospel to keep the peace because that's not peace at all the water the, the gospel can't be watered down you have to preach and teach all of it not just parts that some people may like and won't get offended by the rest of it it needs to be the truth. In verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith. Above all, take that shield of faith. The average soldier, legionnaire at this period of time, of course, had that shield. Some of the movies that have come out in the last 10, 15 years have been uh, very accurate as far as the wars that the Romans fought, that the armor that they had, the shields that they used, it could protect them. And they used those shields in battle, pushing the enemy back. And if the arrows were in the air following them, they would put the shields over their heads that would protect them that way as well. But this is the shield of faith, which is even more important. Because without the faith, like the truth, we're spiritually dead without it. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. We know that this is, chapter is sometimes referred to as that hall of fame of faith. Because those who truly had the faith that God was looking for, that's why they're named in this passage, and they're numerous. But notice also how it starts out in verse 1. Now faith is the substance or the assurance of things hoped for. The evidence or the conviction of things not seen. Now, I can know that the Bible is God's holy word. It's not just some kind of blind leap of faith. I could prove it that it is. But also notice verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. We have to have faith. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If we don't really believe, if we don't have the faith, then we're lost. Likewise, we need that shield of faith for our protection, just as like it was with protection for that Roman legionnaire so many years ago. But why did Paul say above all? Did you ever wonder about that? Above all, take that shield of faith. Well, that we would be able, there's that word again, 
that we would be able to quench all, not some, but all the fiery darts of the devil. Do we ever take courage from that? We put on this armor. If we have these weapons, we don't have to fear. And I mentioned this the other day, whether whatever happens in this country, we don't have to be afraid. Because our God is still in heaven. He's still sitting on his throne. And he's still in charge. It sure isn't man. He is. And Satan has a lot of darts to throw at us. This would be an interesting study. And uh, I'll probably try and work on this in the near future. But think of some of the darts that devil has to throw at Christians. They're so numerous. This could be one of those series sermons. You think about the dart of doubt. Have we ever doubted? Maybe ourselves. Have we ever doubted something about the scriptures? Maybe it's the possibility that we weren't going to be able to follow it. Dart of doubt. Another one closely tied to that is think about that dart that the devil throws at us the dart of discouragement. It's easy to get discouraged. And you, you just think about the brotherhood over the last 15 years. So many wants faithful schools of preaching. So many wants faithful congregations. So many wants faithful gospel preachers Fallen away. It is discouraging. And then it also you have the, the biting and devouring one another. That the scriptures warn against. People just not getting along. If anybody is to get along it should be brethren. The closest thing to heaven on earth is the Lord's church and the fellowship that's found in it. We shouldn't be attacking one another. That irks me to no end when I hear someone putting down another person just because they maybe dislike them, some of their foibles, and here's a faithful brother or sister. It's disappointing. There's the doubt, uh, the dart of discouragement. It's easy to get discouraged. The dart of death, our own upcoming death, the death of loved ones. I remember a story one time of a, a young lady whose father passed away and they were lowering him into the ground and she jumped on the casket. I will never see him again. You will if you're faithful. Death doesn't have to be one of the darts of the devil. I think one of the greatest darts, this is not going to be under the heading of a D, is apathy. Indifference. It's easy to become indifferent. The ways of the world creeping in on us, but we become indifferent we'll decide, you know what, it won't hurt to miss some services every once in a while. We are becoming indifferent. Indifferent leads to our souls being lost. But apathy, that's, a, that's one of the devil's greatest darts. And who hasn't faced these darts? You think of some of the greatest Christians that you've known in your life, I guarantee you they've been discouraged. They probably thought at one time or another, is this really worth it? But they don't give up. That's why they're faithful. But it's easy. We could all become discouraged. We can be discouraged by some in the Lord's church even. But we need to keep on. We need to remain faithful. Our faith must be strong. 
and it will be if we trust in him knowing that he is he's their help their shield which means he's our help he's our shield psalm 115 11. this take the shield of faith and that's not the shield of faith only either by the way that shield won't save anyone it sounds good and of all the false doctrines I was going to believe in, once saved, always saved, boy, that, that would be mine. I would even be here tonight. Because that's, it sounds really good, but you don't find it in the scriptures at all. Not anywhere. Faith without works is dead, James stated in James 2.20. You want to prove your faith? Be involved in the Lord's work. Do what he says to do. The Lord's work, not somebody else's work. But also uh, mentions take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. You think about a head injury, whether it was the Roman soldier back those so many years ago, a soldier today. If it did not kill them, they were disabled on that battlefield. And then they could easily be put to death as well. The helmet of salvation is even more important for the child of God. Now remember, this epistle was written to the saints there at Ephesus. We must take, that word's mentioned a number of times, take and we need to put on daily that helmet of salvation to protect us. Of course, it's always possible and we've known people, after they obeyed the gospel, they fell away. And Peter wrote about this. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, he writes about this, the danger of that happening. It could happen to us if we're not careful. Let's just turn over to that. Speaking of the faithful, once faithful Christians, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. It had been better for them never to obey the gospel than to obey and fall away. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. I think one of the greatest tragedies of hell, along with of course the pain, being taken from God's presence for all eternity for the child of God that once was faithful and fell away is they're going to have all eternity to think, I didn't have to be here. I was faithful at that one time. I didn't have to be here. And they'll be able to dwell on that forever. And I bet you, some will be thinking, if they could go back in time to that last time they were at services, they would have repented. And it'll be too late. But it's also true for that faithful child of God who continues to remain faithful. And blessed are those who never did drift away from the Lord's church. Who constantly remained faithful throughout all those years. They have that hope of salvation. They have a guarantee that they'll be with God for all eternity. And then it talks about the sword of the Spirit. You, know, you remove that S from that sword, and you've got a word, the word. The sword of the Spirit. That Roman sword was, as I mentioned earlier, it's going to go down in history as one of the great, our greatest weapons. It's only 22 inches long. Later, they would have these long swords, these broad swords, but if you're hand-to-hand, -hand, close contact, you needed a short one. It was, it was wicked. Only 22 inches long. It was sharpened on both sides, so it cut both ways. 
you could slash with it or you could drive it through a person. That's God's holy word if you think about it. It can be used a number of ways. It cuts coming and going. With uh, Stephen's preaching, it cut them to their heart. And they killed him. With Peter, in Acts chapter 2, that preaching, they were pricked in the heart by his preaching. And about 3,000 souls obeyed the gospel that day. But it won't return into God void, Isaiah 55, 11. It will do everything. It will accomplish everything that he wants it to accomplish. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 with me. This is talking about the sword of the Spirit. For the word of God is quick, it's alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and of the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. If we allow it, it will tell us who we really are. It will be that, that spiritual mirror that we can look into and know the improvements that we have to make. Jesus used it against Satan. You remember when Jesus was being tempted. We need to be able to use it as well. That Roman soldier had practice. Lots of practice and using that sword at that period of time. How much practice do we use with God's sword? The word of God. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Cutting straight. Second Timothy 2.15. Do we practice? Do we know how to wield the sword of the spirit? To be able to use it? to defend the truth, to teach others the truth, to remain faithful to the truth ourselves. We should be able to. In Psalm 119.11, we read, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Verse 9 of that chapter. I like that passage too. But we need to be effective in using the sword of the Spirit. But here we have this, this armor that God has given to us, these weapons that we can use to hold off those fiery darts, the wiles of the devil, the ungodliness that's in this world. But we need to put that armor on. We need to use that armor. We need to use those weapons. He's not going to do it for us. I can't do it for you, and you can't do it for me. This is something that we all must do. And it's only after we put all the panoply of God, all of this armor on, that we are prepared for that day, any day. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. That should be our motto. Strong in the strength which God supplies through his beloved son. But you know, to be able to use this armor, one must first be a soldier of Christ. If you're not a New Testament Christian, you have no hope. You don't have this protection. You don't have the help of faithful brethren around you, the fellowship, to provoke you into love and to good works. You're lost. No hope of eternal life. But Jesus died on the cross for you, for us, that you wouldn't have to die lost. He gave his only begotten son. That's how much he loved us. But we must believe that he is the son of God. Be ready to, to repent of our sins, to change our lives, the sins that we're involved in now, to give them up. Confess his name before others that you believe and to be baptized for the remission of those sins. 
to have them completely washed away, that feeling is a wonderful feeling. To be a new creature, sanctified, set apart from the world, now to be a service to him. If we've done those things, if we have fallen away, if we're lost in sin, no hope of salvation, we don't have to remain that way. We can repent of it. If it's of a public nature, we'll pray for you this very evening. Your sins will be forgiven. And you can walk free of that sin from this day. If that's your need, we pray that you will come forward. Let's stand and sing.